Hello and welcome to Time for God from St Peter's Bexhill. Don't forget that this week we actually start meeting for real in the community centre opposite the church, so do join us if you can. But if you're watching this, well, you are watching this, then do come along as well because the two services are very similar, but there are some differences. We will keep on sending out this service, but they might vary a little. So come along and do a compare and contrast. Today we're thinking about two readings. We're thinking about Jesus saying he is the good shepherd in John's Gospel and we're thinking about Peter and John in the book of Acts being hauled up in front of the council in Jerusalem and their bravery in speaking up. Now we'll think about them a bit later. For now I want to think about sheep. How many sheep does it take to make a sweater? The answer is, I didn't know they could knit. How do sheep keep warm in the winter? With their central bleating. And where do sheep go to get a haircut? The bar bars. More specifically, I want to focus on a line from our first reading this morning. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. This is a theme that runs throughout the whole Bible, that God is the shepherd and by extension, we are the sheep. Now, we often have quite a sentimental picture of shepherds. You might well have some china ornaments like the picture on the sheet. But being a shepherd is and has always been a full on job. On good days, it might look easy and even relaxing, but you may have seen the video of sheep farmer Amanda Owen's trailer being swept away by Storm Cara. There's a link to the video again on the sheet. It is not easy and shepherds tend to work on their own for a lot of the time, so it's no surprise that bad shepherds don't look after their sheep properly. They will take every opportunity to do as little work as possible. But the good shepherd works very hard. And the good shepherd, Jesus, is the best person we could possibly have looking after us. He cares about each one of us and knows each one of us by name. Now, we talk about the good shepherd quite often in church, but we've never tackled it through a puzzle. So it's about time we did. It's a famous puzzle. It's the shepherd, the wolf, the sheep and the cabbage. You may know this famous game. Now, the good shepherd, I've got a good shepherd, he's quite young, has to carry the cabbage, it's a lettuce, um, and the sheep, the sheep and the wolf. I haven't got a wolf, so the teddy bear will have to do. He has to carry them across the river. The problem is that the boat, the boat, a cardboard box, is only big enough to take the shepherd, who rows, and one other at a time. Okay. Now, when he's around, the sheep and the wolf behave themselves and nothing gets eaten. But the shepherd knows he can't leave the sheep with the cabbage or the wolf with the sheep, as one will eat the other. Wolves don't eat vegetables, obviously. So how does the shepherd get them all safely across the river? You might like to pause the video for a moment and see if you can work it out. The answer's on the sheet. Sometimes you have to work hard to be inspired. The good shepherd gets all of us home. He makes sure we have everything we need, like cabbage. And he protects us from the wolves around us. And even if we start out as bad people, like the wolf, he still gets us home. The Good Shepherd wants everyone and everything to be safe and at peace. So, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Again, you might like to pause the video at this point for a song. I suggested Beautiful Saviour. There's a link on the sheet. So now let's go back to Peter and John in that reading from the Acts of the Apostles. 
Being put in prison might not seem an obvious part of a mission plan, but that is where they are, and it is. Peter and John healed the man in the entrance to the temple and have been telling people about why and how. They've been telling people the good news of Easter. And as a result, they've been arrested. The temple authorities were so annoyed by what Peter and John were saying, talking about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, as we heard last week, that they had them thrown into jail. In a way, you can see their point of view. There in the centre of Jerusalem, right in the entrance to the temple, a huge crowd had listened to these two men telling them about Jesus. We are told that there are now about 5,000 believers. It is a big crowd right in the way. Things are changing very quickly. So when the following morning, Peter and John are brought out in front of the rulers, elders and teachers of the law, look who is there. Peter and John on one side and Annas and Caiaphas on the other. Let's recap. We have Peter, who had run away from the cross so spectacularly, and John, who is storing all this up to write about one day. And we have Annas and Caiaphas, the ones who were involved in the trial of Jesus that led to his crucifixion. Quite a lineup. And Annas and Caiaphas are furious. They ask Peter and John to explain themselves. By what power or what name did you do this? They ask. How dare they talk like this? And then Peter and John are off again. Just as Jesus said would happen. They are given the words to say and they say them. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they say, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you, healed. The people around have no choice but to hear. Wow. Now you may be thinking that, of course, that was then. Things like that don't happen today. One Easter Sunday a few years ago, a pastor in Uganda, Kifa Sempangi, was on his way home after taking the morning service in his church when he was ambushed by a gang of armed men. We are going to kill you, said the leader. If you have anything to say, say it before you die. Kifa was terrified. He thought to himself, they won't need to kill me. I'm going to drop dead anyway. But then... As he later said, from far away I heard a voice, and I was astonished to realise that it was my own. I do not need to plead my own cause, I heard myself saying. I am a dead man already. My life is dead and hidden in Christ. It is your lives that are in danger. You are dead in your sins. I will pray to God that after you have killed me, he will spare you from eternal destruction. That came as quite a surprise to Kiefer himself. But what happened next was even more amazing. The leader of the gang, who a moment earlier had been threatening to kill him, visibly changed. He said to the pastor, Will you pray for us now? And suddenly the tables were turned. Instead of facing death, Kiefer was able to offer these men life eternal life. And so he prayed for and with them, there and then. All five men in that gang went on to become members of Kiefer's church. Well, that was quite an extreme case, of course, even if it is in modern times. But it was a very long way away in Africa. For us, here and now, it's all very tempting not to talk about our faith at all. Even if we are asked, we feel embarrassed. We fear we might, in, might offend. We might embarrass ourselves as much as the person we are talking to. But now is not the time to be embarrassed. Now is the time we are needed as much as ever before. As Christians, we all too easily persuade ourselves that we mustn't force feed people or put them off. That we mustn't, in fact, actually talk about Jesus at all or God's involvement in our daily lives. 
the words get stuck in our mouths. Jesus sounds so, well, holy. Now, certainly ramming God into people's faces all the time or not respecting other people's opinions is not helpful. It is both unloving and counterproductive and can be embarrassing or just plain boring for the people we meet. But there is a very real danger of avoiding doing the very thing that Jesus commissions us to do and to avoid doing it in the many situations where people want to hear what we have to say. Situations where people might otherwise lose out on the love and forgiveness and peace that God is longing to give them and has entrusted us to deliver. As church finds its way out of lockdown, we have an amazing opportunity to build back something wonderful. In our gospel reading this morning, we hear the famous and much-loved words of Jesus himself, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is deliberately picking up on an image used throughout the Bible and taking it further. He describes himself not just as a shepherd, but as the good shepherd, the one who gathers the flock and tends the sheep, looking after all their needs and leading them to safety. He is even ready to lay down his life to die so that his sheep will be safe. We will be safe. And John's Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles both reflect on what all this means and how it all works out. They admit that sometimes sharing good news can have a cost, but the point is that it shows God's amazing love. And very importantly, it also shows that Jesus was not forced to die. It would have been possible for Jesus to avoid it, right up to his very last breath. This is the wonder at the centre of our faith. Jesus chose his path to the cross. Even as he was dying, he was goaded to show his power by coming down off the cross. But his is not that sort of power. It was then, at the moment of greatest weakness, that Jesus actually showed his greatest strength, his strength of complete love. And we are called to pass it on, to tell people about it. And it is often when we feel at our weakest, when we feel tempted, have no confidence or nobility or glamour, these are often the times that the Holy Spirit works through us most powerfully the times when we haven't the strength to do it on our own, we can only do it with God. I don't know how Peter and John felt when they stood before the very people who had sent Jesus to his death, but they stood and the Holy Spirit gave them the right words to say. Things worked out. If only we would all trust God like that more often, who knows what the Good Shepherd might do then? Who knows what sheep and wolves might come home across the river? A man was flying from Atlanta to Dallas to a conference, and in the seat next to him there was a little girl with Down syndrome. They said hello as they sat down, and then after a while she turned to him and asked, Do you smoke? No, he said, I don't smoke. That's good, she said. My mummy says you shouldn't smoke. Then she pointed to the businessman who was sitting on the other side of him and asked, Does he smoke? The man was naturally rather embarrassed by this, but he thought he ought to humour her, so he asked the businessman sitting next to him, Excuse me, but do you smoke? No, he replied. That's good, said the girl. There was a bit of a pause. Then a few minutes later, the little girl asked, do you love Jesus? Well, yes, the man replied. As a matter of fact, I do love Jesus. That's good, she said. Everyone should love Jesus. And then it dawned on him what she was going to say next. And he hunched down in his seat and hoped against hope that she wouldn't. But she did. The man next to you, she said, does he love Jesus? So he swallowed hard 
and turned to the businessman sitting next to him and asked him, Do you love Jesus? And with a tear in his eye, the man replied, Do you know, I've been waiting for someone to ask me that for a very long time. And so a preacher, Milton Cunningham, on his way to a theological seminary in Dallas, led that businessman to Christ there and then on that aeroplane. All thanks to a little girl's utter lack of self-consciousness. Amen.